what happened in episode 4 of the final season of Game of Thrones, and what does it tell us about what will happen in the rest of the season. Hi everyone, this is Robert. Welcome to In Deep Geek. If you want regular insight and intelligent debate about Game of Thrones and more, then click on the subscribe button in the bottom right-hand corner of the screen. We start in the aftermath of the Battle of Winterfell. Everyone is mourning the dead and celebrating the living. Danny whispers something inaudible into Jorah's ear, reflective of the unspoken nature of the care they shared for each other, and Sansa pins her stark brooch to Theon as a final recognition of his coming full circle in protecting the Starks. Jon's speech at the cremation is also quite poignant. He talks about the Fallen having been the shield that guards the realms of men, effectively making them all honorary members of the Night's Watch. And he also, pointedly given what is to come, talks about how everyone set aside their differences for the fight. People did set aside their differences last episode, but for the rest of the season it will be very different. The atmosphere at the meal after the cremation is understandably awkward, Danny's move to legitimise Gendry as clever, not just because she gains an ally, as Tyrion notes, or because it lifted spirits in the room, but because it is a subtle show of force. She is showing that she is the Queen. Only a monarch could legitimise a noble's bastard and make them Lord of the Stormlands. She is showing that she is the only one capable of doing that. And her attempts to curry favour can probably also be seen in her toast to Arya Stark as the hero of Winterfell. But throughout it all, she can see that although she may now be accepted by some, she isn't loved. Indeed, she's still viewed with much suspicion. Tyrion and Davos are right to be concerned about what will happen next, because what happens next is a series of encounters and decisions that entrenches the existing tensions and will form the basis for the final act of this drama. The starting point, of course, is Jon's true identity, or more precisely, who knows about his true identity. He and Daenerys finally get the chance to finish off that conversation they started in the crypts, and it's clear that although they still love each other, Jon at least finds the fact that she is technically his aunt, well, a bit icky. What Danny says to him is undeniably right, and proven right in this very episode, that if knowledge of his parentage gets out, everything will get a whole lot more complicated and dangerous. Jon may not want the throne, but that doesn't matter. People will get behind his claim regardless, and tear the fragile alliance apart. Tormund already refers to Jon as a king and an all-round hero. Sam has pushed him to press his claim. Sansa, in telling Tyrion about it later, refers to Jon as someone better than Danny. Varys definitely thinks Jon is more suited to the throne, and so on. Danny can see where this would lead. Her begging Jon to keep it a secret is understandable, but Jon's insistence on not lying to the Stark siblings is also understandable. And such is the stuff of tragedy. Everything seems inevitable from this point on. When Jon tells Sansa and Arya, the seeds of the tragedy are sown. It will not end well. This isn't to absolve Danny of any blame. Her language usage again betrays her. She talks about people trying to get Jon to take what is hers, the Iron Throne. But in the show, at least, it has been made very clear that Jon has a better claim than her under usual Targaryen succession practices. But she doesn't want to give up on what she has been seeking for so long. If people push Jon to press his claim, it won't be to take what is rightfully hers, but because they know it is rightfully his, and because they think he would do a better job as ruler anyway. John tells Sansa and Arya, and Sansa tells Tyrion, and Tyrion tells Varys, and as Varys notes, by that point it is no longer a secret. Soon even more people will know. We should note that Sansa swore to John not to tell anyone, but did it anyway. He won't be happy with her, particularly if it leads to the kind of splits and tragedy it surely must. We had a couple of reminders in this episode that Sansa is not the person she used to be. On the upside, she seemed to have come to some kind of peace with the horrors she lived through, viewing them as making her the person she is now. 
But on the downside, this is deliberate manipulation and breaking her word to John. She's a player of the game now, and she's not just going to play by other people's rules. And this simmering tension plays out in how Danny acts. Her planning session contains some good news, that they still have about the same size army as Cersei, astonishingly given what happened last episode, that Yara has reclaimed the Iron Islands for Danny, and that the new unnamed Prince of Dawn has declared for her. But she seems in a hurry to get on with it. When Sansa quite reasonably requests that the soldiers be given a bit of time to recuperate from the rigours of the battle, Danny just rejects the idea, seemingly not even caring what advice her generals might give her about the condition of her soldiers, and Tyrion seems to feel the need to clarify that the aim is to take out Cersei without murdering hundreds of thousands of innocent civilians. You'd hope that was the kind of clarification that wouldn't be needed. Anyway, Danny reunites with her dragons and heads off down to Dragonstone. This prompts a whole series of exits from Winterfell. Jon and Davos head off south with the army. The plan is for them to meet up again with Danny outside King's Landing, so we'll see them again next episode. Jon's leaving has a number of elements to it. Sam and Gilly say farewell, and Gilly reveals she is pregnant, and they say that if it's a boy they'll name him after Jon. For those keeping an eye out for these things, this is yet another echo of Frodo and Sam's relationship in Lord of the Rings. Sam Gamgee named his first son after Frodo, like Sam Tarly is going to name his after John here. And Frodo, after all was done in that story, just headed off into the west, weary of this world. Tormund here offers John a chance to head off into the north after it is all done. It seemed a throwaway line, but it wouldn't surprise me if that is how it ends for John. John doesn't seem to want to rule, and I haven't seen him happier than when he was celebrating simply being alive with Tormund and the Wildlings, and Ghost will be there, because John sent him north with Tormund. Poor Ghost didn't even get a pat farewell here, just a sad look from John. Maybe they will be reunited north at the very end. A guy can dream. Jamie heads off south. His motivations here are less clear. He and Brienne seem to have set up home together in Winterfell during this episode. The timing is not clear because of the jump cuts, but this must have been a few weeks or even a couple of months later, because news of Euron's surprise attack on Daenerys has reached the north. They've had a chance to settle down as a couple. And Jamie, on hearing news of the ambush by Dragonstone, which we'll talk about more in a moment, decides to go down to King's Landing himself. His words to Brienne seem harsh, telling her all the bad things he's done and how he did them all for Cersei, but actually I suspect that he was trying to protect her. He knows that as long as Cersei is alive, he can never truly be free. He's going there to confront her and break free once and for all. The Hound heads off. He muttered darkly to Sansa that only one thing would make him happy, and it's pretty clear that this is a showdown with the Mountain. It's where his story started, with his brother shoving his face into the fire, and probably where it will end. Arya also heads off south, saying she has unfinished business too. This is clearly about her kill list, and the only two names still on it are the Mountain and Cersei, so it seems likely that the two of them will have a cause in common when they get there. Expect them to cooperate in that kind of unspoken, cynical, gruff but respectful way that they do. Intriguingly, neither of them expect to return. This doesn't bode well for poor Gendry, who presumably will have to find another person to help him figure out what it means to be a lord. His proposal just brought things to a head. Arya never wanted to be a lady, and still doesn't. Her, that's not me, line is reminiscent of what she said when Nymeria walked away from her. It does leave us wondering who she thinks she is. A Stark and a faceless assassin, perhaps. It would probably have been more sensible for Arya and the Hound to coordinate with the wider plans about getting to Cersei, but they seem to prefer being alone together and doing their own things. So, we have a lot of characters heading south, but the major action in this episode happens when just the first group, Danny, her dragons and her fleet, arrive back at Dragonstone. At which point, we should cut to Cersei. 
While our attention has been on events in Winterfell, she has been spending her time solidifying her grip on the capital and preparing for Daenerys' arrival. First of all, there's the ongoing pregnancy subplot. Cersei's now saying that she's pregnant with Euron's child. It's hard to know what to think here. She told Jaime she was pregnant with his child last season, and that has to be several months ago in real time, and yet she doesn't seem to be showing. So perhaps she was lying to Jaime back then to keep him close, or perhaps she's lying to Euron now, or both. Or perhaps this is all just overthinking it and the showrunners aren't paying too much attention to timelines at this point. In any event, the pregnancy subplot is clearly not going away, and I suspect that we will learn the truth of it only when Jaime confronts Cersei, as he surely must when he gets to King's Landing. Second, Cersei seems to have embarked on a propaganda war, welcoming the small folk into the Red Keep to offer them protection against the foreign usurper. This is clearly a trap designed to goad Danny into killing small folk in her quest to defeat Cersei, which would only prove the point Cersei is trying to drum into people. She will protect them, Daenerys wants to harm them. And we should see the rest of Cersei's plan in this context too. She doesn't need to kill Missandei like that later in front of Daenerys, she did it to anger her. And it worked. But... Let's back up a bit, because the first part of her plan to get Euron to destroy Danny's fleet and one of the dragons off the coast of Dragonstone also worked really well. Danny was left with not much of an army, and so effective do those scorpions look that she would be endangering Drogon with any attempt to attack King's Landing. We should give Cersei some credit here. She has been ruthless, but undeniably effective so far this season. She let Danny throw her army against the army of the dead, and from looking like she was barely keeping hold of her grip on power, she is now in a commanding position. Danny's forces are seriously lacking in numbers, and the seeds of treason, or whatever you want to call it, that we talked about earlier in this episode, are clearly going to grow and come to fruition next episode. Varys basically tells Tyrion that he has decided to switch sides because he cares about the small folk and has lost faith in Daenerys. Tyrion hasn't decided on that yet, but his attempt to broker peace with Cersei only resulted in Missandei's execution, so he won't have gained in her affections there. Grey Worm and Daenerys' obvious distress at Missandei's death are compounded by Missandei herself effectively using her last words to encourage Danny to burn them all, the one thing Tyrion has consistently been trying to prevent her doing. Episode 5 is going to be another traumatic one. Danny is going through some pretty traumatic times here already, and gives a good speech about wanting to rid the world of tyrants, and we should cut her some slack, but her talk of wanting the small folk to know who to blame when she firebombs King's Landing is not making it easy to love her right now. She hasn't done it yet, for all her threats, and perhaps never will, but this is undoubtedly going to be the issue on which people like Tyrion decide who to support. But what else happened here? Well, Bronn showed up in Winterfell. As I suspected, he remembered Tyrion's promise to double whatever anyone else offered him, and he effectively negotiates his way up to being given Highgarden and being named Warden of the Reach, ruler of the richest region in the entire Seven Kingdoms. And this time, he actually didn't need to do anything except not kill the Lannister brothers. If anyone's actually winning out of all this carnage in the Game of Thrones, it's Bronn. And elsewhere, Bran seems to fade a bit more into the background. He confirms that he doesn't want to rule Winterfell, effectively leaving it to Sansa, who is the only surviving Stark who does want power, and says to Tyrion that he exists mostly in the past now. Perhaps there will be a final twist with him, but for this episode at least, he seems to have stopped manipulating people. He leaves it completely up to Jon whether to tell Sansa and Arya about his parentage, for example. What's next? Well, I'll do a full trailer breakdown soon, but it's clear that a lot of characters are now descending on King's Landing. Danny, Tyrion, Varys and Grey Worm are there already, hanging out at Dragonstone. Jon and Davos will be arriving in a couple of weeks. Arya and Sandor will arrive soon after, and Jaime a little after that. Usually with Game of Thrones, the penultimate episode of the season is the one with the most decisive action, with the final episode tying up loose ends. This may well be the case again. 
Please join me for live streams on Thursdays and Sundays all through the season, where I'll be discussing what's going on in the show with special guests and making predictions about future episodes. If you'd like to see more of my Game of Thrones Season 8 videos, please click on this link on the left of the screen. Or if you'd like to support the channel, or get some exclusive content or priority access on my live streams, please click on the link to my Patreon page on the right of the screen. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you again soon.